Mark Frazier. I'm a co-active director at the India China Institute. Uh, I know uh, a lot of you I see there in the audience, but uh, to those I don't, um, and to those I do know, welcome and thank you for coming. Uh, we uh, were so happy that we could um, organize this, this talk uh, for today. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleague Carlos Foreman for his assistance in helping us put this, put this together, uh, and uh, the ICI staff for uh, arranging this, this distinguished room upon which we see uh, one, if maybe not, if not any Chinese uh, <laughs> intellectual uh, uh, representative, maybe, maybe one or two from the Qing Dynasty, long the way, yes. Um, but we, again, it's my, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce to you today our, our speaker, uh, Professor Eric Gerlich is, as, as all of you know, um, a distinguished social theorist, critic, uh, uh, critical theorist of global capitalism, um, as well as a, a, a leading uh, intellectual historian of modern China. Um, he uh, was on the faculty at Duke University uh, for 30 years uh, before moving to the University of Oregon, where he was the Knight Professor of Social Science and a number of, uh, some of the positions involved at various centers there, the Center for Critical Theory and Transnational Studies. Um, just to name a few of his most recent uh, books, uh, one, uh, the 2006 publication from Paradigm, Global Modernity, Modernity in the Age of Global Capitalism, a theme that we'll be hearing about uh, in part today uh, from his talk. Uh, and a book that I only discovered recently, uh, uh, that was out in 2012, and I'm quite interested in, in reading Sin Culture and History in Post-Revolutionary China, The Perspective of Global Modernity. Um, I think uh, I will stop there. Uh, our, our distinguished speaker needs no further introduction. I'll only say that the, the title of, of today's talk, uh, which we uh, believe we can make available a uh, paper make it available uh, shortly after today's session. It's also being recorded, so those of you who know people who weren't able to make it today but really wanted to see this, uh, we'll have it uh, on the website in a few days and uh, a copy of the paper that Professor Gerlich has been kind enough to, uh, to, sh to share with us. The title is Crisis and Criticism, The Predicament of Global Modernity. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I was uh, thinking uh, uh, the last time, is this working? Yeah. Uh, the last time I was here, I think, at the new school was in 1996 when Monthly Review had organized uh, a conference for the 30th anniversary of the Cultural Revolution. So it's uh, wonderful uh, to be here. Thank you for having me at such short notice. Uh, uh, I'm going to read a paper today uh, that, that uh, I, I have a uh, I have this problem I cannot write short papers uh, and, uh, I began to write a talk and it became a 35 page paper so I cannot obviously uh, read all of it uh, I, I just want to highlight before I uh, start reading parts of it I'd like to I'd like to give an idea of what this is about in fact uh, thinking about it, uh, I was wondering if the paper should more appropriately be titled uh, Culture and Criticism because that is really what is going on in the paper. That in other words, what, how do we practice criticism at a time when there are so many different cultural claims on modernity uh, that, uh, that uh, promote their own systems of knowledge. Uh, that, that. And this is the problem that has been intriguing me as I thought uh, uh, when I was coming here, uh, some friends in, uh, in the University of Pittsburgh asked me to give a talk and uh, they are mostly uh, English and humanities people. So I thought I would deal with this issue of uh, criticism uh, with an emphasis on culture. The second thing that uh, I should probably alert you to is uh, uh, in the paper that uh, uh, most of our critical practices of this generation, of the last couple of generations, 
Then we go back to the 1960s, the, the radical upheavals of the 1960s. And now that we have left those far behind and seem to have entered a new phase of develop, of, in the development of capitalism, what do we do with these legacies of the 1960s? Are they still pertinent? Or do we need to rethink them in light of the reconfiguration of global power relationships. Those are the two issues uh, that really inform the paper. The paper itself is divided into three sections. Uh, the, the first one deals with the People's Republic of China, in, uh, and in particular with reference uh, to the uh, Confucius Institutes. Uh, the uh, second part of the paper uh, deals with the issue of what I call our ways of knowing. Uh, this, uh, the title actually comes from an earlier article of mine which had been presented in Beijing University back in 2001 or 2002. So I've been concerned with this issue uh, for some time now. And then the third part of the paper, I turn to the issue of, uh, of the Enlightenment since the Enlightenment has been under attack for, for, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, <coughs> culture reasons. Uh, what I'm going to do today, however, is read the first and the second parts and only briefly go over the uh, third part. If issues arise, we can, uh, we can deal with them uh, uh, during the discussion section. I would like to enter my discussion through a scandalous incident that took place at the recent 20th biennial meeting of the European Association of Chinese Studies. Some of you may have heard about this. The meeting this year, hosted by the universities of Minho and Coimbra in Portugal, was devoted to the exploration of the development of China studies, entitled From the Origins of Sinology, to current interdisciplinary research approaches, bridging the past and future of Chinese studies. When they received their conference programs, the participants discovered that two pages had been torn out of the programs by the organizers, apparently at the insistence of Madame Xu Lin, Director General of the Hanban, that's the Confucius classroom, the People's Republic of China state organ in charge of the so-called Confucius Institutes, who in 2009 was appointed counselor to the state council with vice ministerial rank, presumably in recognition of her contribution to the propaganda goals of the state. The pages torn out related to the Jiang Jingo Foundation in Taiwan, which long had sponsored the EACS, the European Association for Chinese Studies, and according to a report in a Taiwanese newspaper, donated 650,000 Taiwanese yuan, or around US 22,000, to the series <coughs> meeting. EACS, EACS investigation of the incident also found that according to Madame Xu, some of the abstracts in the program, quote, were contrary to Chinese regulations and issued a mandatory request that mention of the support of the uh, Confucius China Studies program be removed from the conference abstracts. She was also annoyed at what she considered to be the limited extent of the Confucius Institute publicity and dislike the Jiang Jigo Foundation said presentation. This act of academic vandalism has been met with dismay, at least among those who are still capable of being shocked at the intrusion of PRC propaganda organs into the very institutional structures of academic work. The, the frustration with the Confucius Institutes is not restricted to scholars of China. The Canadian Association of Higher Education Teachers and the American Association of University Professors 
have both rebuked universities in the two countries for allowing Confucius Institutes into universities and or for their compliance with the terms set by the PRC. University of Chicago professors have petitioned the university administration to reconsider its agreement with the Hanbat. The most thorough and eloquent criticisms of the institutes have been penned not by a China specialist, but the distinguished anthropologist Marshall Salmons. This broad involvement of university faculty indicates that the issues at hand go beyond Confucius Institutes or the PRC and is revealing of accumulating frustration with significant trends that promise to end higher education as we have known it. The institutes have been beneficiaries, but also possibly the most offensive instance to date of the increasingly blatant administrative usurpation of faculty prerogatives in university governance, progressive subjection of education to business interests, and the normalization of censorship in education. At the behest of the Hanban for confidentiality, agreements over the institutes have been entered, in most cases, without consultation with the faculty, or at best, with select faculty who, whatever the specific motivations may be in individual cases, display few qualms about complying with trends to administrative opacity or the secrecy demanded by the propaganda arm of a foreign state. The promise of the institutes to serve as bridges to business opportunities with the PRC has served as a major enticement, giving business and even local communities a stake in their acceptance and promotion, but further compromising academic autonomy. Despite all manner of self-serving protestations by those involved in the institutes, formally entered agreement to avoid issues that might conflict with so-called Chinese cultural and political norms, or whatever might, as the cliche goes, hurt the feelings of the Chinese people, translates in practice to tacit self-censorship on questions the PRC would like to keep out of public hearing. The well-known issues of Taiwan, Tibet, June 4th, jailed dissidents, etc., etc. It also legitimizes censorship. These issues concern or should concern everyone who has a stake in higher education. The questions facing scholars of China are narrower in focus and more specific to disciplinary concerns, but they may be even more fundamental and far-reaching in their implications than the institutional operations of the university. Beneath mundane issues of language teaching, teacher quality, academic rigorousness, lies a very important question. Who controls the production of knowledge about China? Like other similar organizations, including the, including the Jiang Jibo Foundation, the Hanban has already entered the business of sponsoring research and conference, conferences in research universities. But control is another matter. Interestingly, in its very vulgarity, Xu Lin's attempt to suppress the mention of a Taiwan competitor at an academic conference brings up this question more insistently than the sugar-coated representations of Confucius Institutes as simple providers of knowledge of Chinese language and culture to school children or as facilitators of business. The conjoining of teaching and business in Hanban activity itself should give us pause about easy acceptance of those representations. But the problem goes deeper. It is a puzzle that a great many commentators in the US and Europe should be in self-denial 
about PRC aspirations to global hegemony when, within the PRC, it's a matter of ongoing conversation among party leaders and influential opinion makers, as well as the general public. To be sure, there's no end of speculation over elusive questions of whether or not and when the PRC might achieve global hegemony. But there is far less attention to the more immediate question of aspirations to hegemony, except for some people on the right, possibly because it might fuel animosity and ill feeling. It seems safer to go along with the more diplomatically innocuous official statements that all the PRC wants is equality and equal recognition, not world hegemony, even as it carves out spaces of influence around the globe. In recent years, PRC leaders have made no secret that they wish to replace the existing world order over which the U.S. presides. At the most modest level, President Xi Jinping's suggestion to the U.S. President that the Pacific was big enough for the two countries to share as part of a new great power relationship was remarkable for its erasure of everyone else who lives within or around the Pacific. It would take the, it would take the utter blindness of servile partisanship to portray PRC activity in Eastern Asia based on spurious historical claims as anything but moves to establish regional hegemony, which John Mersheimer has argued is the first step in the establishment of global hegemony, a Monroe Doctrine for Eastern Asia. At the popular level, an obscure philosopher at the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Zhao Tingyang, has achieved fame nationally and, interna and in international power circles for his design of an alternative to the current international system based on a modernized version of the hierarchical under heaven, Tianxia, uh, international uh, tributary system that informed imperial China until the early 20th century. Zhao's work is interesting because there's been a claim as a plausible example of the call for international, international relations theory with Chinese characteristics that corresponds to the PRC's rising status, a call that eloquently brings together knowledge production and the search for hegemony. The prevalent obsession with tagging the phrase Chinese characteristics onto everything from the most mundane to the most abstractly theoretical is well known. But it seems to have acquired some urgency with the Xi Jinping's leadership's apparent desire to regulate uh, Western, in quotation marks, in Western influence on scholarship and intellectual activity in general as part of his wanted China dream that also includes the elimination of corruption along with rival centers of power, enhancing party prestige and control over society, and the projection of PRC hard and soft power, both hard and soft power, both upon the global scene. The policy blueprint laid down in the landmark third plenary session of the 18th Central Committee stressed, I quote, the strengthening of propaganda powers and the establishment of a Chinese system of discourse to propel Chinese culture into the world at large, end of quote. The discourse is to be constructed upon the three pillars of, quote, the fine tradition of making Marxism Chinese, end of quote, or socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, the creation of a contemporary Chinese culture by melding the Chinese and the foreign and the old and the new. So these are the three elements. The Xi leadership's stress on the 
90 year revolutionary tradition, perhaps the foundation of party legitimacy is not necessarily in conflict with the plans for greater integration with the global neoliberal economy, since party theorization of so-called Chinese Marxism, Jungo Marxism, the uh, Chinese Marxism, uh, the content of socialism with Chinese characteristics, is subject to change in response to changing circumstances and in accordance with the policies of each new generation of leaders. While the China dream is the subject of ongoing discussion, Xi Jinping has made his own long-standing dream, going back to the early 20th century, of the rejuvenation and renaissance of the Chinese nation as the marker of uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics under his leadership. Lest this be taken to be a return to a parochial conservatism, it is important to, it's important to note that discussions of Chinese discourse note his emphasis on making our own the good things from others, as well as making the old serve the present as fundamental characteristics of Chinese cultural identity. It might be recalled that the latter slogan, making the old serve the new, uh, caused much distress among foreign observers during the Cultural Revolution amidst reports that peasants, taking the slogan at its word, had begun to dismantle the Great Wall to use its stones to build homes for themselves. Presently, according to President, President Xi, the rich products of this so-called 5,000-year-old tradition should be taken out to the world to foster awareness of the universal value of a living Chinese culture that transcends spatial and temporal boundaries in its rich intellectual and artistic achievements. He also called upon Chinese scholars around the world to tell China's story. A PRC expert on foreign relations and the U.S. active in global international relations circles has provided a convenient summary of party leaders and intellectuals' close attention to discursive struggles over the last decade, beginning with the Hu Jintao leadership and its institutional and intellectual consequences. The motivation, as he puts was to carve out a political cultural space of its own, corresponding to the PRC's rising stature as a world power. Although China has already joined the mainstream international community through this policy, one of the main findings of the paper is that China does not want, I'm quoting here, this is a quotation, that, that China does not want to be a member of Western system, uh, I'm quoting it verbatim without any sex or anything, you know, like that. Instead, China is in the process of developing a unique type of nation building to promote the Chinese model in the coming years, end of quote. The formulation of a Chinese discourse was both defensive and promotion to defend the PRC against its portrayals as a threat to, to the world economy and politics, but at the same time to promote an image that would enhance its reputation in the world as a counterpart to a declining U.S. hegemony, caught up in constant warfare, economic problems, cultural disintegration, and waning prestige. It's interesting, however, that revamping the propaganda apparatus in public relations guise drew its inspiration mainly from the U.S. example. The major inspiration was the idea of soft power formulated by the U.S. scholar and one-time government official, Joseph Nye. U.S. public relations practices and institutions are visible in everything from sending intellectuals out to the world to present a picture of PRC realities as the Chinese people, this is a quotation, perceive them to hosting international events, 
from publication activity in foreign languages to TV programming, from students sent abroad to students attracted to the PRC, and in the wholesale transformation of the very appearance and style of those who presented the PRC to the world. The idea of discourse was, of course, Foucauldian in inspiration, subject to much interpretation and misinterpretation. But its basic sense was quite clear. Participants in the discussion of discursive power and in its institutional formulations, quote, once again, all emphasize discourse as a kind of power structure and analyze the power of discourse through the lens of dominant characteristics such as culture, ideology, and other norms. They consist of the ways we think and talk about the subject matter, influencing and reflecting the ways we act in relation to it. This is the basic premise of discourse theory, end of quote. And they all share a common goal, according to this author. In his words, which again I present without editing, I quote, obviously, China chooses to join the international society led by a Western value, Western value held concept from 30 years ago. But it did not plan to accept completely the name universal value concept of the Western countries, nor wish to be wish to be a member of those countries. Instead, China wishes to start from its national identity and form a world from China's world and insist on the, develop, insist on the development, development road with Chinese characteristics so as to realize the great revival of the Chinese nation. In order to realize this century dream, China is busy drawing on its discursive power and achieving this strategy with great efforts in public diplomacy, end of quote. Confucius Institutes, going back to 2004, were conceived as part of this discursive struggle with, quote, Confucius identified as a teaching brand to promote the Chinese culture, end of quote. Language teaching was crucial to this task. The number, of foreign, the number of foreigners learning Chinese, 40 million at last count, is itself a matter of pride. But the ultimate goal is the assimilation of Chinese culture through introduction to the language and whatever cultural resources may be available locally. Uh, just to give a couple of examples, from the University of Binghamton, from Binghamton University specialized in Chinese opera. Uh, UC Davis uh, uh, in uh, California uh, specializes on cooking, taking advantage of the wine country. And in, in places where do not have these problem characteristics, it's uh, singing, dancing, whatever. That, that, that. Uh, it would be good to know how so-called Chinese culture is actually represented in the classroom beyond these consumer routines. To my knowledge, no one has so far been able to do a thorough ethnography of the institutes, partly because of the opaqueness at the mandatory request, so-called, of the hanbang of their operations. One of the most interesting and probably far-reaching aspect of hanbang educational activities is to employ higher education Confucius institutes as platforms to reach out into the community and public school classrooms. While we may only guess at the intention behind this outreach, I think it is plausible to assume that they are not there to train future China specialists, although that too may happen, but to create cultural conditions where China ceases to be foreign and acquires the same kind of familiarity that most people around the world have with United States cultural activity and products. At its best, to feel at home in a Chinese world. Kids in kindergarten and elementary schools are more likely to be amenable to this goal than the less reliable college students. Lest it seem that I am reading too much into this activity, let me recall a portrayal of an imaginary Chinese world by Du Weiming former Harvard professor, 
prominent promoter of Confucianism as a global idea, and presently founding dean of the Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies at Beijing University, a highly respected and influential senior intellectual. In an essay published in 1991, he offered the following as a description of what he called cultural China, I quote. Cultural China can be examined in terms of a continuous interaction of three symbolic universes. The first consists of mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore. That is, the societies populated predominantly by cultural and ethnic Chinese. The second consists of Chinese communities throughout the world, including a politically significant minority in Malaysia and a numerically negligible minority in the United States. The third symbolic universe consists of individual men and women, such as scholars, teachers, journalists, industrialists, traders, entrepreneurs, and writers who try to understand China intellectually and bring their conceptions of China to their own linguistic communities. In other words, I would be a part of the third circle. As For the last four decades, the international discourse on cultural China has been shaped more by the third symbolic universe than by the first two combined. In other words, China scholars, etc. Sinologists in North America, Japan, Europe, and increasingly Australia have similarly exercised a great deal of power in determining the scholarly agenda for cultural China as a whole. End of quote. China's rise over the last two decades has reconfigured the geography of cultural China and the dynamics of the interaction between these three symbolic universes with the relocation of the center in mainland China, which now seeks to bring the other two spheres under its hegemony. We need not, we need not view Du's description, this is a du meaning description, as some kind of blueprint in order to appreciate the valuable insight it offers into reading the contemporary situation. The PRC seeks to bring under its direct rule the Chinese societies of Hong Kong and Taiwan, with Singapore somewhat more problematic, given its distance from the mainland. And this, despite the fact that it served as a model for PRC development beginning in the 1990s. Chinese, ob Chinese overseas are obviously a major target of PRC cultural activity, especially now that their numbers are being sw swollen by new immigrants from the PRC with considerable financial and political clout. What I have discussed above and the Shulin episode provide sufficient evidence, I think, to indicate the significance placed upon expanding the third sphere and shaping its activities. Hegemony over the production of knowledge on China is crucial to this end. There is nothing particularly earth-shattering about this activity, except that the PRC's habitual conspiratorial behavior makes it seem so. We may observe that the PRC is doing what other hegemonic powers, especially the US, have done before it, recruit foreign constituencies in the expansion of cultural power. To put it in mundane terms, as the so-called West it's established its global hegemony by creating westernized foreigners, the PRC is in search of hegemony. The PRC in search of hegemony seeks through various means to expand the sphere of Chinized foreigners, as that uh, author I discussed before, he puts it, Chinized foreigners to use the, there has been considerable success over the last decade in promoting a positive image for the PRC globally. Although it is still unclear how much of this success is due not to cultural activity, 
but the economic lure of a fast developing economy. PRC analysts are quite correct to feel that this may be the opportune moment, given that the existing hegemony is mired in social division, dysfunctional political conflict, continual warfare, and the seeming addiction to a culture of violence. I'm talking about ourselves now. It is also the case that the craze for what is called development trumps in the eyes of political leaders and large populations around the world qualms about human rights and democracy, especially where these are not major concerns to begin with. It is also the case that similarly to its predecessors, going back to the Guomindang, its predecessors in China, going back to the Guomindang in the 1930s, the current PRC regime has been unable to overcome a nativist provincialism intertwined with anxieties about the future of the Communist Party that's a major obstacle to its hegemonic aspirations. Complaints about cultural victimization and national humiliation sit uneasily with assertions of cultural superiority and aspirations to global hegemony. Anchorings for a global tianxia, the global under heaven, ignore that despite the scramble to partake, to partake of the PRC's economic development, other nation states are just as keen about their political sovereignty and cultural legacies as the PRC itself. Just as surely they are aware of the spuriousness of claims to genetic peacefulness when PRC leaders with enthusiastic support from public opinion, openly declared that national rejuvenation includes the recapture by force, if necessary, the domains of their imperial predecessors and then some. Uh, this uh, this gen genetic peacefulness is, uh, is a reference to a statement that President Xi made uh, that the uh, Chinese are genetically indisposed to warfare. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the University of Military Affairs, <laughs> interestingly, uh, apparently published a volume that's quoted by somebody else, I have not seen it, that uh, counts uh, uh, more than 3,000 wars over 3,000 years, come to an average of 1.4 wars a year for Imperial China. <laughs> so, so that's uh, genetically indisposed. Uh, Pursuit of the globalization of so-called Chinese culture is accompanied by a cultural defensiveness that tags Chinese characteristics to everything from the most mundane everyday practices to crucial realms of state ideology. Claims of universal value for Chinese cultural products are rendered questionable by the simultaneous denial of universality as a tool of Western hegemony. PRC leaders and their spokespeople officially deny any aspirations to global hegemony, needless to say. But then we might wonder what they have in mind when they accuse other powers of obstructing China's rise when those powers celebrate the PRC's economic development on which they have become dependent and allow its propaganda organs into their educational systems. Similarly, if the goal is not hegemony over knowledge production about China, why would these same leaders and their functionaries be so concerned to show the world the universal value of Chinese civilization when that is already very much part of the global perception that has made the PRC the beneficiary of a benign orientals or tear pages of a conference program on the Jiang Jingguo Foundation, which shares the same goal of promoting Chinese civilization. While the new public relations approach has yielded impressive results, discursive struggle entails more than a competition in the global cultural or discourse market, as they call it, but finds expression also in the suppression of competing discourses at home and abroad. 
the good things from the outside that uh, that uh, the uh, party program refers to, the good things from the outside world do not include the seven deadly sins, that's my term, which have been expressly forbidden as, quote, dangerous Western influences, end of quote. And, uh, and these are the values, universal values, freedom of speech, civil society, civil rights, the historical errors of the Chinese Communist Party, crony capitalism, and judicial independence. And of course, a number of these items are actually granted by the Chinese constitution. There is a PRC constitution that grants freedom of speech. There is that. While the PRC boasts a constitution, talk of matters such as constitutional democracy is not to be permitted. A prohibition against the use of terms like democracy, dictatorship, class, etc., has been in effect for some time, and according to a colleague from Shanghai, authorities look askance at the use even of a seemingly, uh, see, seemingly inane word like youth in titles of scholarly words, youth, Qingye. Just recently, the Institute of Modern History at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences was chosen by the Party Central Commission for Discipline Inspection as the location from which to warn the Academy that, quote, it had been infiltrated by foreign forces, end of quote. The persecution and incarceration of both Han and minority scholars and activists who transgress against these prohibitions is a matter of daily record. The same commentator who was cited above for the reference to a global discourse market writes that, basically speaking, the prohibitions have not changed the widespread attitude of reverence in the intellectual world, Chinese intellectual world, for things Western, quote, the blind and superstitious following of Western scholarship and theories and entrapment in the Western discourse pitfall, end of quote. People may contend all they want, she concludes, but the discourse we need is one with Chinese heirs that strengthens China's discursive power. This translates in practice to the construction of theories including Marxism, and historical narratives built around Chinese development with the party at its core that may also serve as inspiration, if not an actual model for others. The case of the PRC is especially important for illustrating the challenge to knowledge production uh, the, the challenge to knowledge production of the reconfigurations of global power, but it is by no means the only one. Arguably, even more egregious than Xu Lin's attempt at censorship at the EA, EACS conference was the lawsuit brought against the University of Chicago's uh, scholar Wendy Doniger's book, The Hindus and Alternative History, for its alleged insults to Indian religion which resulted in Penguin Publishers' agreement to pulp the copies of the book in India. The lawsuit was brought by Adina Nath Batra, whose own books devoted to purging the study of the past of Western cultural influences have been compulsory reading in Gujarat <coughs> under State Minister Narendra Modi, now the Prime Minister of India. The Modi government recently appointed as the chairman of the, of the Indian Council of Historical Research, a little-known historian, at least that's what Indian historians say, that he's a little-known historian, uh, uh, also devoted to what scholars describe as the saffronization of education. If such incidents were just about censorship, we could easily ignore them as merely more vulgar and extreme case of censorship, which is not particularly novel at either the national or the global level, including the USA. 
This is not to downplay their significance as threats to democracy and academic freedom globally, as they also set examples for others. Silence before such acts <coughs> is to be complicit in oppressive practices. Nevertheless, it would be a serious mistake to allow preoccupation with these oppressive practices to distract attention from even deeper problems with long-term consequences. What renders these acts truly significant are the alternative knowledge or value systems in whose name the censorship is exercised. The grievances that they express are hardly to be denied. Nor may we dismiss without due consideration the alternatives they offer at the time when the existing order presided over by Euro-American hegemony shows every sign of being unsustainable materially and spiritually. It has been clear for some time now that our ways of knowing are in deep crisis. The social upheaval of the 1960s brought diverse new constituencies into educational institutions who demanded representation both in the content of learning and its mode of delivery which has expanded the scope of knowledge enormously, but also made it more complicated than ever to determine what is and is not worth knowing. Similarly, on the global scene, post-colonial and post-revolutionary regimes that emerged from post-World War II national liberation struggles demand new kinds of knowledge that counter the erasure of their pasts and their cultural interests by colonial domination and imperialist hegemony. This has been a concern all along of Chinese revolutionaries of differing stripes. The Gandhian legacy in India is even better known. The list may easily be expanded to include diverse peoples around the world, from indigenous peoples to formerly imperial entities such as Turkey where I was born. The colonial hubris that progress or modernization would do to forgetfulness the pasts of the colonized or the dominated overlooked the very part colonial domination and imperial hegemony played in provoking the construction of the pasts that would serve the cause of independence and development. Those pasts have surfaced with a vengeance, insisting on their own voices in modernity and the inclusion of their past in its making. Their very presence exposes the fallibility of the knowledge claims of Euro-modernity and the damage it has inflicted on nature and human societies in the very course of forcing them onto the path of so-called progress. Almost by tacit common consent, it seems modern knowledge is on trial, facing claimants who demand recognition of their various versions of how things came to be and where they would like to see them headed. These claims, however, are beset by contradictions. The same processes that have opened up the intellectual space to alternative modernities as they are described also are inexorably forcing people into a common future that will allow no viable alternative, what is commonly called globalization and or development. This is a condition that I have described as global modernity, the simultaneous integration of the world through the globalization of capital and its, and its fracturing along a variety of fault lines which finds expression not only in, co in the conflicts of interest but in the, asser in the assertion of reified sovereign cultural identities. The contradiction is visible also in the realm of knowledge in the denial of universality to social, political and cultural practices while endowing with nearly universal status the logic of technology 
in the culture of consumption. The former appear not only as endowments of nations or civilization, but also as guarantors that identity will not be lost in its globalization. This is the significance of knowledge production in support of the cultivation of those values. On the other hand, it is difficult to keep apart the two realms of knowledge, the kind of knowledge for success in the capitalist economy and the kind of knowledge necessary to the cultivation of national or civilizational identity as the dynamic interplay between the two realms produce new demands on identity and subjectivity. For over a century now, Chinese thinkers and leaders have not been able to find an answer to their, to their search for a modernity that would preserve and strengthen a Chinese substance with Western instrumentality, the famous T. Yong distinction. Indeed, I hope it's clear from my discussion about of the search for a Chinese discursive system that even the effort to eliminate the influence of so-called Western discourse resorts to a conceptual vocabulary provided by the Latin. This does not mean that there are no real differences among peoples, but it does suggest that those differences be viewed at all times also through the commonalities which are also a pervasive presence. It seems deeply ironic that economic and to some extent social and cultural globalization should signal the end of universals, but it is not very surprising. Political universals follow the logic not of philosophy but of power and hegemony. Globalization may have been intended to complete the conquest of the globe for the capitalist modernity that for nearly half a millennium had empowered Euro-American domination. Capitalist modernity has emerged victorious, but contrary to expectations, rather than buttress the existing centers of hegemony, its benefits have gone mostly to challengers who now make their own claims on global power and hegemony. In the process, denying the universality of value and knowledge claims that for two centuries have denied recognition to their intellectual and cultural inheritances. The denial of universality is at bottom little more than the denial of Euro-American hegemony in search of intellectual and ethical sovereignty. With the exception of the PRC, I think, whose aspirations suggest not just a defensive nationalism, but alternative global designs. It might be useful here to recall two competing metaphors that appeared in the 1990s almost simultaneously that have a direct bearing on this question. The clash of civilizations put forward by the late Samuel Huntington and hybridization that has had the central place in post-colonial criticism. We can see both paradigms at work in the contemporary world, albeit in different mixes and subject to local inflections. It is interesting that both paradigms criticize the Eurocentric universalism, if for different reasons. Huntington's exclusivist culturalism led him to advocate hardened cultural boundaries for the reason that others did not or could not share the values the West considered universal. Postcolonial criticism, on the other hand, perceived in hybridity the possibility of rendering cultural boundaries porous as a first step in the recognition of cultures only unsuccessfully suppressed under Euro-modernity and offering the possibility of exchange and negotiation between different cultural entities once they had achieved some measure of equivalence. Radical critics have understandably been drawn to the latter alternative, and in the process ignored the appeals of the clash paradigm among patriotic groups 
including leftist patriotic groups in countries like China, where memories of revolutionary anti-imperials survived the abandonment of revolution. The puzzling attraction to Philip Schmitter's friend-enemy distinction among such groups appears more easily comprehensible when taken in conjunction with the Huntingtonian anticipation of clash if and when these groups emerge from under the hegemony of Western civilization, which they already seem to be doing when he offered this paradigm in the early 1990s. The clash paradigm has insistently moved to the foreground over the last two decades. The hybrid paradigm is by no means dead, but its vulnerabilities have also become increasingly evident. Cultural hybrids are not things as they may appear in their biological counterparts, uh, like nectarines as a fur, but complexes of relationships and contradictions, the resolution of which depends on concrete historical circumstances. Put bluntly, depending on context, hybrids may end up on the political right or the left or anywhere on a broad spectrum of possibilities. The stress in much post-colonial criticism on hybridity along ethnic, national, or civilizational boundaries, moreover, invites reification of these categories, distracting attention from the differences and hybridities in their very constitution. In a global environment of counter-revolutionary shift to the right, combined with nostalgia for lost imperial greatness, pressures to exclusionary culturalism along these boundaries are quite powerful, despite intensifying transnationalism propelled by a globalizing capitalism. This may be seen, for example, in the growth of diasporic nationalism in closer identification with nations of origin, especially in the case of countries such as the PRC, India, and Turkey, which have registered impressive success in their ability to employ globalization to national ends. What these changes imply for critical practice is worth pondering. Globalization insistently forces into one common intellectual space diverse conversations on knowledge and values. It creates commonalities, but also differences that challenge assumptions of universality in hegemonic societies that long have been able to treat alternative voices as a minor nuisance. Comparisons between the present and Cold War conflicts are widely off the mark. Cold War confrontations between capitalism and socialism presupposed competing political economic spatialities, but shared common assumptions about universality. Socialism assumed national form, to be sure, but we may recall that differences between existing socialist societies were voiced in the language of revisions, suggesting deviation from a political project informed by universal principles. To take the case of the Chinese Revolution, when revolutionaries in the 1940s began to insist on making Marxism Chinese, the project was conceived as the integration of the universal principles of Marxism with the concrete circumstances of the Chinese society. The phrase is still commonplace in ideological discourse in post-revolutionary PRC but more as a fading trace from the past than a meaningful guide to the future. The globalization of capitalism has abolished the competing spaces of political economy. Differences are expressed instead in claims to alternative cultural spaces. Socialism with Chinese characteristics is above all a cultural idea yoked to aspirations of national rejuvenation that are conspicuously suspicious of universality. To speak of revisionism in our day 
would no doubt seem farcically anachronistic. The global space capitalism claim in the aftermath of the Cold War is already fragmenting under pressure from claims, to culture, claims of cultural difference empowered by reconfigurations of the capitalist world economy. If universalism persists as a goal, it can no longer be phrased in the same terms as it was under the hegemony of Euro modernity, but will have to be formulated out of contemporary conversations that now include voices silenced or marginalized under the regime of Euro modernity. Rescuing alternative knowledge and value systems from the erasures of Euro modernity has been part and parcel of radical critical thinking since the 1960s, nourished by a very universalist belief in the possibility of human diversity. This task is much more complicated than it may appear. What these alternative knowledge and value systems consist of has been open to question all along, whether we speak of the cultures of women, ethnicities, indigenous peoples, or nations and civilizations. The traditions that identified nations and civilizations in Euro-American modernization discourses were reified misrepresentations of complex intellectual and cultural legacies, often with blurred boundaries between the inside and the outside. Diversity in these societies is erased by a multiculturalism that similarly identifies authentic cultural identity with reified traditions. The relationship to Euro-modernity has been equally complicated. After two centuries of global revolutionary transformation, it is hardly possible to speak of East-West, Asia-Europe, Chinese-Western, etc as if they were mutually exclusive cultural entities. The cultural identities that are ascribed to Chineseness, Hinduism, Islam, or even more crudely, continental entities like Asia and Europe are ironically legacies of Euro-modern reification of these cultural entities. Their defense equally notably draws upon the language of critical analysis that is rejected for being Western. Their sustenance requires not only warding off baneful Western influences by political fiat, but also erasing or rewriting memories of their own revolutionary pasts in which those influences played crucial parts. After all, while the Communist Party of China may insist on the Chineseness of its Marxism, there is still a persistent reminder in the term Marxism of what it owes to the outside world and the universalist vision that initially inspired its politics. Scholars of religion have argued that religion itself is a category that came with the so-called West along with all the other disciplinary appellations that have shaped the discourse on learning globally. The point here is that how we respond to claims on alternative knowledges and values, or what appears in our discourse as national or global multiculturalism, is not simply a matter of respect for difference, or of cultural tolerance or cosmopolitanism but is deeply political and in its implications that calls for critical judgment and discrimination, not just on competing cultural claims, but more profoundly the notions of culture that inform them. Radical multiculturalism driven by universal human goals that temper difference with commonality is a different matter entirely than the multiculturalism of an identity politics obsessed with difference, with little regard for commonality, the managerial multiculturalism of transnational corporations, or the consumptive multiculturalism promoted by global capitals. 
the appreciation of cultural complexity, as Ulf Hammerts uh, called it, the porosity of cultural boundaries, and the historicity of culture that emerged from the radical struggles of the 1960s, challenged the reification of culture in modernization discourse, but never quite overcame it. It has retreated in intervening years before the so-called polyculturalism of multinational corporations, which uh, that was the, who began to promote it just about the same time in the late 1960s. I wrote an essay a number of years back saying that it, in the case of the United States, the notion of multicultural first emerged with uh, multinational corporations. Uh, you could already find the term in the late 1960s in management textbooks on the term polyculturalism is the same idea, that how to manage uh, labor course from different backgrounds, the, the, the idea. Uh, difference, likewise, has come to overshadow commonality as categories that inspired collective affinity and action, such as class or third world solidarity, have lost their plausibility or have been systematically discredited along with the universalist ethic in which they were grounded. In her recent study, Moral Clarity, Susan Neiman writes that, quote, the relativism that holds all moral values to be created equal is a short step from the nihilism that holds all talk of values to be superfluous, end of quote. We know that just as all cultural legacies and practices, including our own, are not bad, neither are they all good. We know that different cultural orientations have different motivations and consequences, so they are not all equal without resorting to the language of good and evil. We know, or should know, that everyday life presents us with antinomies where choice seems impossible. We are all familiar with problems in the imposition of gender norms across ethnic and national boundaries. How do we respond when an elected member of the National Assembly is prevented from taking her seat on account of wearing a headdress, setting secular against democratic commitments? This happened in Turkey a number of years back. How do we respond when in the name of national order and security, a state abuses its own citizens and intellectuals? What do we do when the identification of national culture with a set of religious precepts results in the oppression, not only of its secular intellectuals, but other sets of religious precepts upheld by its minority populations? Perhaps most relevant to the question at hand of critical practice, how do we respond to the bizarre proclamation of an American academic that academic freedom is a Western idea that should not be imposed upon others when a PRC academic loses his job for his promotion of so-called Western freedoms? There are differences within differences, and dealing with them calls upon us to make choices, choices that are not just intellectual, but deeply ethical and political. Neiman's study is devoted to an argument for the retrieval of enlightenment values that have been under attack for the last half century from the left, uh, from the left for their alleged complicity in Euro-American imperialism, and from the right for the secular humanism that allegedly has undermined national morality and purpose. The argument draws on the work of Jonathan Israel, who has drawn a distinction between radical and moderate enlightenment, with the former supplying most of the values that have come to be associated with enlightenment as such. Israel identified the basic principles of radical enlightenment as, I quote, democracy, racial and sexual equality, individual liberty of lifestyle, full freedom of thought, expression, and the press, eradication of religious authority from the legislative process and education, and full separation of church and state. Its universalism lies in its claim that all men 
have the right to pursue happiness and women uh, have the right to pursue uh, happiness in their own way and think and say whatever they see fit and no one including those who convince others they are divinely chosen to be their master rulers or spiritual guides is justified in denying or hindering others in the enjoyment of rights that pertain to all men and women equally. These are the same values, we might add, that are condemned by spokespeople for the PRC regime, Orthodox Muslims, fundamentalist Hindus, for their incompatibility with so-called native cultures, which, in their claims to cultural purity, find alibi in multicultural reification of cultural identity. Among the foremost casualties of the repudiation of the Enlightenment in cultural criticism is criticism itself. In the words of the British writer Kenan Malik, I quote, the issue of free speech and the giving of offense have become central to the multiculturalism debate. Speech, many argue, must be less free in a plural society. For such societies to function and be fair, we need to show respect for all cultures and beliefs. And to do so requires us to police public discourse about those cultures and beliefs, both to minimize friction between antagonistic cultures and beliefs and to protect the dignity of individuals embedded in them. As Tariq Madud puts it, this a quotation within a quotation, if people are to occupy the same political space without conflict, they mutually have to limit the extent to which they subject each other's fundamental beliefs to criticism. And we go back to Malik. One of the ironies of living in a plural society, it seems, is that the preservation of diversity requires us to leave less room for a diversity of views. What we seem to be witnessing, I might add, is a slide to the logic of communal politics. The motivating impulse behind multiculturalism may be the recognition of difference, but even more significant is the part it plays in producing and defining cultural identities. Let me just wrap this up with this. It may be no coincidence that contemporary attacks on the Enlightenment have acquired a hearing in a literally counter-revolutionary drift globally. Ideas deriv derivative of the Enlightenment have nourished revolutionary or more broadly progressive movements and aspirations for two centuries, not just in Europe and North America, but globally. The relationship of Enlightenment legacies to modern revolutionary movements is as complex as their relationships to capitalist modernity. But the entanglement of Enlightenment visions <coughs> in modern revolutionary movements is one important reason for the attacks directed against it at the time of wholesale repudiation of revolutionary pasts. As in the PRC beginning in the 1980s, revolutions have been consigned to a conservative past, while the mantle of progress has been transferred to an alliance of economic neoliberalism and increasingly dictatorial states aligned with global capital that nourish off cultural nationalism. What needs to be underlined is that the criticism of Euro-modernity is not limited to the repudiation of the hegemony of Euro-America, but also targets the revolutionary past, which appear now not as agents of progress and liberation, but deviations from the proper historical paths of development. In the process, the past that revolutions sought to cast aside as obstacles to modernity have been revived as the sources for alternative modernities. Especially noteworthy is the mutually reinforcing relationship between liberal multi multiculturalism and cultural nativism or ethnocentrism that share common grounds in the criticism of Eurocentrism, which is also their raison d'etre. It is not uncommon these days to encounter attacks in the name of alternative cultural traditions and multiculturalism on legacies of academic freedom and critical thinking for being Western peculiarities. 
even as millions around the world continue to engage in political struggles to achieve those ends. The supposed Western peculiarity, moreover, is under attack in the West itself as institutions avail themselves of a rising tide of censorship and surveillance to restrict free speech in accordance with the dictates of political and economic pressure. Immanuel Kant's own understanding of enlightenment is phrased in terms that are striking for their relevance in a global political environment that seem devoted to the infantilization of populations or in the more colorful phrasing of imperial Chinese critics of despotism, stupid people policy. The terms have been echoed repeatedly in anarchist thinking in subsequent years. I am quoting, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without, guide, without guidance from another. The guardians who have so benevolently taken over the supervision of men have carefully seen to it that the far greatest number of them, including the entire fair sex, this is Kant, regard taking the step to maturity as very dangerous, not to mention difficult. Having first made their domestic livestock dumb, and having carefully made sure that these docile creatures will not take a single step without the go-kart to which they have been harnessed, these guardians then show them the dangers that threaten them should they attempt to walk along. Thus, it is difficult for any individual man to work himself out of the immaturity that has all but become his nature. Thus, the public can only attain enlightenment slowly. Nothing is required for this enlightenment, however, except freedom. And the freedom in question is the least harmful of all, namely, the freedom to use reason publicly in all matters. Enlightenment is at this, at this the end of the call. Enlightenment is at its most elusive when we may need it the most. Enlightenment universalism is not to be dismissed as merely a handmaiden of capitalist modernity or colonials, even though its entanglements with the latter have marred its image among those who encountered it upon the banners of Euro-American imperialism. We need to recall that it was also the inspiration for radical aspirations to freedom, to live and breathe in dignity. Freedom is the condition of enlightenment, as Kant maintained, but also its goal. It may hardly be discarded for its European origins or the foul deeds that have been perpetrated in its name for it is an integral part of histories globally that continues to inspire struggles for human rights to existence and democracy against the betrayals of capital and its states. The answer to problems of public enlightenment is more enlightenment, not willing surrender to oppression and bigotry in the guise of cultural difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gerlich, for those very thought-provoking uh, remarks. Uh, a paper that, uh, as I heard it, uh, is a, sort of, as you suggested at the beginning also, and in two parts in a way, where uh, there's a discussion about the current uh, effort by uh, PRC government, knowledge production, pursuit of hegemony, and then reflections in the second half on, um, on modernity, uh, enlightenment, and uh, possibilities. I think um, of, of how we can connect um, the, the uh, efforts that are undergoing to monopolize or control the production of knowledge uh, to uh, perhaps a more optimistic kind of outcome. I, I'll just, we'll, we'll 
go around with questions. I wanted to throw out the first one. Would you like to answer these one by one, or should we collect a few? I'll answer one by one. We have more than half an hour. So we, we, have, we have the room until we six. We have time. So uh, uh, I know not everyone exactly. can stay till six. Uh, yeah, it yeah. might be good to uh, collect a few, if, if, you, if you don't mind. Uh, 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 oh, OK. So um, uh, OK, uh, yes. You'll Professor Lee? You'll get yes. my ears. OK. Um, I agree with many of the specifics that you um, mentioned. Um, I personally experienced uh, Chinese hegemony recently when I was speaking with a leading proponent of the Chinese School of IR, and when I brought up critiques, he just completely shut down and refused to talk to me anymore. So that's a personal reaction. But I wonder whether your framing of the problem might be too limited in time and also uh, analytically static because uh, it's uh, an understandable uh, development in terms of collective logic to react to Euro's, uh, Euro-American hegemony with a uh, nativist response, right? But it is that precisely nativist response which will lead to deeper analyses of a history that has been erased. And in that investigation of the erased history will be rediscoveries of one's history that uh, lead away from hegemonic thinking. One example is, uh, in, the, in the Confucian context, is a line from a classic, from one of the Confucian classics, which says that when people from afar do not accept us, we have an obligation to reform our culture so that they will accept us. And the Chinese version of that is, so that they will come to us. And so this chink in the uh, edifice of what is considered Chinese uh, culture, of rediscovery or re-glorification of Chinese history, will lead to other pathways of uh, understanding Chinese history and culture and social relations that lead us away from hegemony and open up an alternative understanding of social relations. Uh, and uh, in particular, um, given the context of who is sponsoring this talk, Indian-Chinese relations uh, have been very complex, very multivarious, a mutual, uh, mutually and reciprocally uh, learning. So that uh, perhaps the first wave of response or reaction to Euro-American hegemony is to say, we are glorious too. So, so that's a, a, a re reconstruction of a nativist hegemony. But that in that very movement, in that logic, it will lead to discoveries of other histories and self-understandings that take us to another paradigm of social relations, political relations, etc. So that perhaps your analysis, your framework, even though I agree with all of the specifics that you mentioned, may be too limited in both time and in analysis, that it may be too static. And so I am more optimistic than you are because I see an internal logic developing that could lead us away from this hegemony and counter-hegemony movement. See any other hands up? Would you like to answer that, Brett? Okay. Um, um, and, 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 and related to, to what Freddie just said, um, a, anyone who uh, has spent any time in a, in, in a corporation or a, in a vertically integrated organization understands that you have to adjust conform to the norms of that culture. And um, with, the, uh, uh, with the dispersal of populations around the world today, um, there, there's a, a need to define a new culture um, that, uh, that finds uh, uh, a common denominator of some kind. Uh, and I think we're in the process of trying to do that. We're trying, certainly in the process of trying to do that economically. But uh, uh, I, I think we're in the process of trying to figure out how to do that culturally. 
And, and so if you if you if you contend that uh, uh, only, only with diversity is there richness, uh, then then we 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 might tend towards um, chaos of some sort. Uh, but if we uh, in, impose some kind of uh, uh, cultural demands, uh, the, the way you have in, 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 in corporations, um, and we, we might uh, emerge with a common culture, at least one that's acceptable to the elites. You want me to do those first? The, 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 those two here, yeah. I have. Attack. Uh, you, you, you know, I, uh, <coughs> I, I don't know what's going to happen 50 years from now. Uh, I, I, uh, I know what has happened in the past 50 years. And, uh, and, uh, and to me, these things don't just happen by themselves. That, uh, the, the whole point here is that uh, we are dealing with uh, increasing political controls on speech. You know, it's quite possible that they, in fact, it's quite possible that the uh, Communist Party will be, will be gone sometime in the near future, and uh, something else will replace them, and people will uh, uh, will analyze uh, what's going on. But what the, what we are talking about the play is a play is a is a period when uh, when history is being censored. It's a very interesting that, that incident I mentioned that Cass. Uh, it's been very intriguing to me that they would uh, they would go to the Institute of Modern History to launch a new political campaign. And I've been you know I've been involved with uh, historians of China for the last thirty years. I know what they think or what they would like to think. So uh, we are not talking about a free exchange between different cultural approaches to history. We are talking about the domination of intellectual work in the interest of a state that censors things that it does not burn. Okay, and uh, I, I mean, I make a colleague, I, I understand that, you know, you've got to find, uh, find your niche and everything, but uh, uh, American companies, from, as far as I'm concerned, have been complicit. In, in, in the oppressiveness of the regime. Because they, they look at these companies, you know, they come no matter what. They will make movies with the Chinese content, whatever it is. They will not question this, they will not question that. So they go, and it's very interesting that, you know, there was a recent uh, symposium uh, on these Confucian Institutes that uh, uh, everybody participating, they're all China scholars, so you know, probably. Everybody participating was critical of them, except for one person who used to be the head of the Chamber of Commerce in Beijing. Who they, they, they don't want to endanger business by criticizing. Now, what happens when people are afraid of criticism? Uh, and not only that, you bring it home. Uh, you, you, you know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 there was an incident last year in Oregon. I live in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, Oregon State University is in a little town called Corvallis, which is for, uh, you know, 20 miles, uh, 30 miles north of uh, Eugene. Some, it is an American citizen, uh, some, somebody of Taiwanese origin decided to open uh, a restaurant and call it Tibet House. And he uh, brought an artist from Taiwan to do a mural depicting scenes in Tibet and uh, everything. And somebody in, in uh, Corvallis, presumably a student, because they don't have a Confucius Institute. There's one in Eugene, uh, in the University of Oregon. Uh, reported they saw two, two people from the San Francisco Council wow. show up in Corvallis to, them, uh, to suggest to the mayor that uh, she should do something about this or Corvallis is going to lose out wow. on uh, business with China. That's the first step they use, uh, you know. Sure. And uh, I mean, this kind of offensive behavior has been going on. Like, it's it's even, have no bad champagne, exactly. Yeah, the, 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 and the, and the, the, the uh, congressman for that district, Peter Nafasio, 
actually even stood up in the in the house to condemn this kind of what is this interference with American citizens' right to free speech? So this kind of thing has been happening, and uh, and uh, and I'm appalled at the willingness of our universities to self censor on the, on these issues. So it's not just a business strategy. I mean, you know, you show you. It goes with your niche marketing. I say, is, at which point, of course, you don't even talk about Chinese culture, whatever that may be. But you know, if you if you open a business in Shanghai, you try to figure out what Shanghai culture is like, the, 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 which is not Chinese culture. Uh, and to return to the history uh, lady uh, who disappeared, that uh, to, to to me, the, the question is not what other people do. The question, to me, the question is what I do. You, you know, when, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I encounter these incidents of suppression, uh, I, here I am, a, you know, scholar of China. By the way, I have good relations with the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, you, they, 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 uh, they, 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 uh, and, and I know, I mean, I know people in the party who are very much concerned about what's going on. Uh, you know, I go, I go there. I have dinner with them. They are laughing about the Confucius Institutes that was somebody else's idea, and they are the ones who are talking about the shift to the right. So it's not a question of you know what kind of history may be written in 30 years, 50 years, etc. We are not talking about the free market exchange of ideas historically. We are talking about when you, when I, as a historian of China, encounter this kind of censorship over the practice of historical work. What do I do? Do I go <coughs> silent? You know, it is their culture. Because I know it's not their culture, because I know people who do not agree with these dicta, right? They, so this is, I mean, the, the whole point here is the abuse of the notion of culture and cultural boundary to, uh, to uh, suppress certain kind of uh, practice. That, that is the issue, it's not uh, uh, free exchange or negotiation and uh, the business there. Yes. Yeah, look, let's look at the Romans for a minute. Paisa ke vai, usansa ke trovi. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. When here, do as they do. All right, that was a good philosophy for a great civilization. But let's get the, the essence of it. I took a course in the history of Chinese law, interesting title of the course. What really cuts is when a British citizen a sailor in most cases, got into a conflict in China, which has its own law and Britain has its law. How did they deal? First of all, very few examples, which is good. But when the examples did come up, the British went out of their way to be accessible. And yet, you know, if you had a penalty like you cut an arm off something, that's, that's a little bit rich. In other words, real efforts were made to, uh, to be reasonable in a way that both can understand the situation and that it would come out without a disastrous, you know, but in our day, I think we've lost that sense of diplomacy, we've lost that sense of harmony, and we've become more, as, as you've given examples, hard-edged, we know what we want, and we know what the results should be. So I think those are interesting. Well, we have, uh, uh, we, we, have, we have that problem right now, I mean, you know, I, uh, 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 I, I, I'm not going to go and defend British imperialists. <laughs> that, that's a different matter. But, that, but, but we have a problem involving law. We have a problem right now with the issue of Hong Kong. What's happening in Hong Kong? And uh, somebody, somebody interviewed me about Hong Kong, Hong Kong today. And uh, you know, the basic law that was agreed upon uh, in, in what's 84? Yes. And then, uh, you know, According to basic law, by 2017, there was going to be a move toward a democratic Hong Kong. Etc. And you know what has been happening, right? The, the, uh, uh, how they went about. And, uh, and now, even, even though an international agreement was signed, now the attitude is that this is China domestic affair. You guys have no business involved in that. So, the, so there is a, the kind of arbitrariness that you associate uh, with, with, uh, with the regime. Uh, in, in a way uh, that exploits the international system. I mean, that was uh, my position, you know, when, uh, it, when, uh, when they, they, they entered the, the PRC was uh, 
accept into, into the World Trade Organization, whatever the virtues may be of <coughs> that organization or whatever. But, uh, but that, uh, uh, the, the, I know the goal clearly was how to exploit the World Trade Organization for national ends. You can say everybody, that's what everybody is doing, so what, what, what is about. I, I, and I think I, what, what I try to do, I, mean, I, I really, uh, that I, I, I write critically about what the PRC leadership does. And something, I mean, I, I also understand, you know, they want power, they, they, all, they all want power. They, that's not, that's, as I said, that's not so unusual, that's what everybody, everybody wants. That my concern when I write these things is really for people in the United States. The way they have been so readily uh, willing yeah. to fall under self-censorship, this, that, so that they can have that business. So it is this public that is really my concern because you know Xi Jinping is. A, uh, I mean, uh, I, as I say, I, I've been a visiting professor in, in party think tanks, so they still publish my stuff and everything. But I, you know, okay, but they don't. I, I, I don't try to influence Xi Jinping. But, uh, but look at this society and what's happening. And we have an increasingly bad situation in universities of self-censorship or actual censorship. Uh, and that's what I'm concerned with, you know, when, when I talk about this. This country has a very long history of docility. We're going to need a paper here. Uh, we have a from Professor Rubrilia. I knew you just talked very much, it's very provocative. Um, but I was wondering to what extent uh, you started with uh, you started with a very general question. What are the practices of criticism that are appropriate for an era of, of multiple uh, multiple modernities? And and then you from a very broad question you focused on this very great concern of censorship uh, coming from these Confucius Institutes as an example of a broader phenomenon. Um, but I wasn't sure what the link was between that analysis, which is very compelling. It seems more to do with the fact that in China you have a political monopoly of power. Uh, and it's becoming, it's, it has this very uh, turbocharged capitalist development, which everyone else is depending upon. Well, it itself is dependent on the world buying its product. And then this much broader sweeping critique about debates over knowledge and the role of the Enlightenment and critiques of the Enlightenment, which I think seems to be an area where, of course, there's a lot of debate on that. And I'm just wondering, you know, to what extent the, the situation analyzed in China today with respect to what you were talking about is, has to do with the fact that it is a monopoly of power. And, and in these other situations, when I sort of think of postponing the critiques of enlightenment and thought, there's, there's a lot of force in those critiques. Because, it, you know, as you said in the end, you said, well, the enlightenment's entangled with imperialism. But it seemed like in your talk that both, both sides, both, both enlightenment thought and postcolonial critiques, have contradictions and limitations. But ultimately, it seems in your talk you're saying that post-colonial thought had many more problems in the way in which it's sort of evolved. And I'm wondering if that's what you actually feel, because it seems that, you know, how would I put it? Another way of phrasing it is you make an opposition at the end between enlightenment and the radical enlightenment tradition. And capitalism, but of course, capitalist thought also comes out of that 18th, 19th century tradition of commercial society and Smith and Cardo Marx, so, so, so I was wondering if you said a little bit more about that relationship. Is it, is it that your critique is about when knowledge is, uh, when the production of knowledge is limited by state power, particularly political monopoly power? Or is it the case that you think that there's something inherently limiting about attempts to produce knowledge that are, are critical of the Enlightenment as a as a historical moment. I was wondering how you... Uh, well, what, what uh, I, I mean, the, the, uh, the structure of the essay itself uh, that I had in the I, I, uh, 
I, I try to do two things in that one part. One, there's the act of censorship which needs to be confronted and not permitted as that. But then, when, when someone like Marshall Salas goes into it, he's concerned with the censorship in the American University. Although, of course, Marshall Salas himself, uh, but what, what, what was that, uh, you know, uh, when he wrote the book, uh, one of his last big books, uh, The Farewell to Thucydides. Uh, he actually had this argument. I mean, he's one of the people who influenced me that uh, uh, he said that you don't just do a historical analysis of culture, you also do a cultural analysis of history. In other words, different societies think the past in different ways. Uh, they, they, they. So, uh, uh, but, but in this case, he's just concerned with the going question of that. that, that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but what, what I want to bring to, into this conversation, uh, somebody like Marshall Salvin, is that, that well, that's fine, this is that, and we have a problem in the university of censorship that, uh, that we have to deal with. But there's another problem here that we have to address, because even though, yes, indeed, it is uh, there's a political control of knowledge that uh, prohibits it, I mean, that, that we shouldn't forget, again, that question that uh, they are very suspicious of uh, Confucian modes of analyzing the past also. So it's not just a matter of being foreign, it's just uh, losing control, control over it. So my thing is that, nevertheless, yeah, that uh, despite the censorship, there's also another dimension to it that we should look into. And that is particularly interesting, but that uh, foundation, the Zhang Jingwo Foundation from Taiwan, they try to do exactly the same thing that the Confucius Institute are trying to do, how to spread Chinese culture. Yeah, you know, uh, that, that was it. So, but, uh, but, but that we should also look at this problem, there's an underlying, even though there's abuse here, we need to be aware of what they want, and that, they, that they challenge this Euro-American hegemony over the production of knowledge about China, that, 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 that this is uh, another dimension. And that's where, I, when I move into that other thing about uh, our ways of knowing without uh, thing. Uh, that uh, the enlightenment I brought at the end, the enlightenment section, uh, the part I, uh, uh, I excise, actually there's a, there's a section there on criticism and the enlightenment with reference to Michel Foucault. Uh, you know, by Michel, Michel Foucault had an essay called What is Criticism? And uh, the, uh, the whole idea that, uh, I mean, for, in Foucault's thing, the enlightenment is really about the release of a critical attitude. About the, 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 uh, even though, as you know, Foucault also blamed the enlightenment for all kinds of oppressive uh, practices, etc. But he does, uh, he does have a statement that, look, everybody's trying to come to terms with this enlightenment. Whether you like it or not, we all live within it. You know, the legacies are our intellectual context. In many ways, I feel that the, those legacies are the intellectual context for the people who would reject the Enlightenment also. You know, after all, when you think about it, the whole notion of history, as we understand it, is a product of the 19th, of the 19th century. You know, the, the, it's a post-Enlightenment. There's a, there's, a, there's a difference between having you know, a notion of the past, and, and what we call history is a particular notion of the past, with a particular notion of temporality, etc. that's been brought up. You know, <coughs> I don't know anybody, even the indigenous people who challenge it work with that notion of history. You know, the you know, the new temporality, you want to call it. But, but, but connected with it as required is a deep-seated notion of critical practice. Kinds of criticism and, 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 and of course, this is what uh, Karl Marx, you remember that statement, the uh, ruthless criticism of everything that exists, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, they, 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 this is a very euro modern attitude. It's not that other people did not have criticism or, uh, you know, all kinds of, uh, whether it is Chinese or Hinduism or Buddhism, there are other traditions of criticism. But here, criticism is built into a very structure of knowledge, I mean, uh, you have to criticize anything. And that's the, uh, uh, the, the that's what I get at, at the end, and, and 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 in the end, I mean, if, we, when, when, if and when we transcend the boundaries of this political power, 
about which I'm not very optimistic because things are getting worse as far as I can tell everywhere I, that I'm uh, familiar with. That, uh, uh, that, that, that nevertheless, maybe there will be a comment, there will come a day when, uh, uh, when people speak to another. And I, don't, I want to clarify one thing about that quotation from Malik, uh, because I thought, you know, that, uh, that I said that Kenan Malik, that uh, I think what he's saying is very important. Uh, this is with reference to multiculturalism. That multiculturalism, in fact, is a denial of diversity. It, rec it recognizes diversity between, you know, so-called cultural entities, but it suppresses diversity within those cultural entities. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, uh, in that sense, I, I, I think of this, you know, as a, uh, as a personal statement too. You know, there are people like me, and there are people like uh, I don't know, there are people, other people in the set that, uh, you know, I, I, I was born in Turkey, I grew up in Turkey. And what does it mean now that given the current contemporary political situation that Turkey, and to be an authentic Turk, you have to be a Muslim. But in my day, that wasn't the case. So, so, so that uh, well, there, there is a notion of authenticity here, that in many ways identify that cultural entity with its most conservative elements. I, I think, uh, you may speak to that, uh, that I, you know, when I was reading that, uh, I, that's what I remember, a reference to Romila Tapar. You know, I mean, these guys are suppressing all kinds of history. They are suppressing Marxism, they are suppressing women's history, they are suppressing this, that. So that, you know, if we identify a Hindu culture as the, as the Hindus do, if you identify India with Hindu culture, what happens to all these other people? Aren't they Indians? And this is where the culture problem emerges. Uh, that, uh, uh, and, and so there's a denial of ground level diversity in the name of a multicultural management of difference. So that was the, the that was the problem. So what I you know uh, I, I I I know I've been doing that recently. You know, writing section by section of the connections where somebody has created. There, there, there are certain links that go there, and I do it. Okay, um, I just wanted to follow up briefly on, on that with a comment, which is, um, as you were talking, I was thinking of, uh, of Presenta Duara's book, Rescuing History from the Nation State. And it is a way what you're saying, um, we need to rescue the production of knowledge and production of culture from the hegemony of the, the state, the nation state that's trying to say, this is China, this is India, this is Indianness, this is Chineseness. And um, also, you know, what do, to take your, your remark about the, um, you know, someone doing an ethnography of a Confucius Institute classroom, I think it's a, a great idea, and I hope someone will do that. Um, are, the, are the people who are hired to teach in those classes, uh, presumably uh, Chinese citizens, presumably PRC citizens, are, do they not have some agency in, um, you know, uh, not always following the uh, uh, central propaganda department's line, are they engaging in a kind of production of knowledge in a classroom in some suburban county in Pennsylvania where they're trying to, you know, because many of them do teach in uh, high schools also, <coughs> it's actually elementary schools. Um, and I just think that there's more, um, you know, possibly more interesting avenues for agency that these are not just these, um, uh, you know, armies of, of people who are out there going rote by the, the dictates of, of the propaganda department and the hotline. If, if you were as a student, you're not an anthropologist. Like that anthropologist argument of age, you see, ah, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, uh, that, that. Uh, there is somebody actually called Jennifer Hubbard. She's at Lewis and Clark College. Uh, she's, uh, she claims she is doing an ethnography. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, at a certain point you can say, uh, you know, why even bother? I'll, uh, you, you know, I had a, uh, uh, I, a couple of years ago when I was visiting Professor Tsinghua, I, uh, uh, I got to meet this uh, woman. She was in her 30s uh, uh, getting her PhD in comparative literature. And uh, she, she took me to lunch with her. She said, I, she says, I mean, the, 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 the ground level reality, she says, uh, I just have to get out. I just have to get out. So I'm going to apply for a Confucius Institute in London to teach Chinese. Now she's, 
she, uh, she was getting a PhD in uh, world literature, but she was going to teach China because she's got to get out of China. She's got to get to London. And then, and then uh, okay, so she went to the interview at the Hanbang, and then a week later we had lunch, I said, I said, how do you do? Are you going to London? She said, no, it's hopeless. Uh, that, uh, she said, I went there, and there were all these young girls, 18, 19, 20 years old, they had all come prepared with songs and dances <laughs> and whatever, and that's what they wanted. I don't even have a chance to compete with them. Yeah, sure, that's the ground level reality. And what they, you know, a lot of them are kids who go to, to get out of China and go and uh, teach Chinese. They definitely you know. But nevertheless, I mean, that's why the, I, I have problems with anthropologists and their agency. I try to think of uh, structures too. I, you, you know, there, there, there are structures surrounding or uh, song and dance routines. That, that, as I said in this paper, these people are also supposed to serve, as you remember what they used to say about the emperor and the spies, uh, the eyes and ears of the emperor. You know, they're also supposed to report. And, and I suspect, as a matter of fact, with this shooting, you know, the one who, uh, I mean, this term, uh, it's like so Orwellian, mandatory request. Why would anybody go along with that kind of vocabulary, mandatory request? That, 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 that. It's, it's quite possible that the shooting was really frightening. Because if this came out, paper, what is the boss going to say back in Beijing? You, you, I mean, she might say, I don't know, I don't know what has become of her. Uh, somebody wrote something about the, uh, you know, the internet in the PRC. Apparently, a lot of people. I wrote a friend uh, in Beida, Beijing University, who's uh, probably the most distinguished anthropologist in uh, China, Wang Mingmi, and he, and he wrote back to me. He said, "This is so embarrassing that this kind of thing." And of course, he attributes it <coughs> to cultural revolution practices. Yeah. And it is indeed, I mean, there was a lot of academic vandalism during the cultural revolution. You know, people attacked one another, the spy on one another, etc. So it's quite possible that, that she was frightened that if this came out, she would be in real trouble back home and, 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 and went to this panic mode and uh, did something that should never have happened. But, uh, but nevertheless, I come back to this that there is a structure of censorship and oppression that's being created here that is important not just for the People's Republic of China, but for everyone. I mean, if, it, if here people go along with that censorship, what happens other places? That, uh, so, so we have a real problem that has to be put on the table. And it is, uh, you know, I think it's one of, one of our duties to do that. Do that. It's not, I'm not going to wait until the, People are have a free exchange of opinions and write a different kind of history, yeah, whatever. Anyway, yeah. thank you. Please join me in thanking our.